Felix Arbers wrote, One sweet, sad secret holds my heart in thrall. A mighty love within my breast has grown, unseen, unspoken, and of no one known, and of my sweet who gave it, least of all. Hello. This is Nelson Olmsted. In the world of literature, there are a great many short stories to meet every mood. Stories of love, terror, adventure, and humor. Today, I'd like to tell you a story by Elsie Lee, and I think you'll agree that it's very moving. It's entitled, Souvenir. You don't remember me, do you, Marcia? No, you wouldn't remember me. Why should you? I was just a kid in high school and not even in your class, and you were the most popular girl in town. You were going to college proms by the time I was old enough for Cinderella Hops. It's ten years since I saw you last. You must be 28 now, because I'm 26. That's a difference of only two years, 26 from 28. But there's a difference of about 10 years between 16 and 18. 10 years ago, I certainly was crazy about you. You were smooth, but not in the way that high school boys use the word. There was a quality of naturalness about you. It was in your easy way of breaking awkward silences and of of always being genuinely interested in the other person. It was in the way you enjoyed tramping around the lake or sitting before a fire or making cocoa and toast. It was how you used your makeup, never obviously, and your clothes, they were just right, too. I still think you're the prettiest girl I ever saw. (laughs) You'd think a man's taste would change in ten years, or that a girl might change a bit. But I knew you as soon as I came into this room. I still like your brown eyes. They're soft and warm with little crinkles at the corners. They look a little sad, And I wonder what's happened to you in ten years to make you look sad. I've changed a lot in those ten years, I know, but seeing you, I realize that I was never able to forget you. Unconsciously, I have always compared the girls I met with you. It was after a football game that I first talked to you, although I don't suppose you remember. It was the first game of the season, and the girls in the home economics course had made cocoa for the teams. You filled my cup from a steaming pitcher, and you said... Nice going, fella. That's when I fell in love with you. Although then I just thought how nice you were to look at. Of course, I knew who you were, although I hadn't met you before. I'd had to wade through piles of snapshots of you and Bill when I came home from camp that summer. The family kidded him a lot about his new flame. I walked home with you that day after the game. Your family had moved across town and you lived in our block. And you said... I know who you are. You're Bill's brother. And I said, yeah, and I know who you are, too. You're Bill's girl. You laugh. You had the nicest, chuckly laugh, as though you knew a nice secret and felt happy about it. And when we reached your house that first day, you said, why don't you come over some night and we'll look through the snapshots Bill and I took last summer? And I stammered like an idiot and finally said, well, uh, how about tomorrow night? I would have said, how about tonight? But I was afraid you might think I was fresh. And you said, Saturday night's fine. That was because you weren't dating much while Bill was away. Well, Saturday was almost the hardest day I'd ever lived through. All day I thought of all the time I had to kill before I saw you. I must have looked pretty repulsive now that I come to think about it. Like a copy of Bill done in Christmas calendar colors. He had brown satin hair... But mine was a horrible shade of red, so curly it would never lie down. It was a wonderful evening. You had the things I was allowed to eat during training, and we sat before the fire. Maybe you'd already begun to guess that Bill was keen about you, just because you were all that was available that summer, and he was the sort of boy who had to have a best girl. I hadn't guessed. Because I was, I thought he must be awfully in love with you, too. 
I thought Bill was everything I could ever hope to be. We talked about him, but only while we were looking at the snapshots. The rest of the time, we just talked. We found out we liked the same books, and I even admitted how much I liked poetry, because I knew you'd understand. I suppose it wasn't much of an evening for you, but it was the most wonderful date I'd ever had. And that was just the beginning. You promised to come to all the games and cheer for me, and you did. Every time I ran out in the field, I'd look for you on the 50-yard line, and you'd wave and yell, Come on, Ramsey! Ram through that line! After a while, everybody was saying it. <laughs> you made me into a hero just like that. I saw you every Friday and Saturday night, and after a while on Sundays, too, because we discovered we both liked music. I used to go over to hear the Philharmonic with you on Sundays and usually stayed for supper. Bill came home for only one day at Thanksgiving. You went out with him. And when he came in that night, he said, Hiya, Butch. I hear you're keeping away my competition. Yeah, I said. She's pretty nice. Oh, swell, swell. Best this town affords. Perhaps I knew intuitively that he was finding plenty of other girls to take to the football games and hops at college. But anyway... I didn't like the way he said that. Come to think of it, he hadn't asked you up to any of the major league affairs at all. The Christmas holidays were fine for you and Bill. You spent all your time together, but even then you were kind to me. It was your suggestion I knew that I go to the movies with you, and Bill came over on Sunday as usual to Hill the Philharmonic. I had never realized until then that Bill didn't care for music. I gave you a ring that Christmas... Very simple. A moonstone set in silver. Perfectly suitable for a young girl, Mother said. Afterward, I found out that the setting was called the teardrop design. Yes, it was suitable. I didn't expect you to wear it on the special finger. But I thought it would look pretty with the sweater you wore to games and on walks to the lake. I took it over to your house on Christmas Eve and you were alone in the living room. And you were so pleased with the ring, you said... Oh, Victor, it's lovely. You have to wish it on my finger for a friendship. I put it on your right hand. Did you guess what I wished for? It wasn't for friendship. After the holidays, you went up to college to see Bill quite a lot. It left a big hole in my week when you were away because we were listening to the opera, too, by that time. And then you offered to help me with my exams, and I started seeing you every evening for an hour or so. And when exams were over, we celebrated by going to the inn for dinner and then to the movies. And on the way home, I told you how good my marks were, and you crowed over me. And I was so elated that I blurted out, I'd like you to go to the prom with me, will you? And you said you would, that you'd always wanted to go with a member of the prom committee so that everyone would have to bow to you. And after that, I walked on air. At least I knew I was good at dancing, and the thought of holding you in my arms while we danced was enough to make me delirious. I didn't tell anyone I was taking you for fear they'd laugh. Dad had a real tux made for me, and I saved my allowance like mad so I could give you orchids, like Bill did when he was home. It was silly, I suppose, but I sort of felt I was Bill taking you to that dance, especially since I'd gathered he wasn't writing as often as he should. I never knew how we came to get mixed up about that date for the prom. I thought I'd told you over and over, but... I guess I didn't. It was so important to me that I thought it must be blazoned in the air in letters of fire. I felt I was really a man at last. I had a new tux and Dad's best set of dress studs. I'd shaved for the first time and bought orchids from a best girl. That's what you were to me. And I was past caring how things ended or what Bill might think. What's more, I was going to kiss you that night. That was a little crazy. Now I come to think of it. I hope, even when you and Bill broke up, you never felt the way I did when your mother said you'd gone up to college for Bill's spring dance. For a moment, I couldn't believe you weren't there. Your mother was very upset. I told her I understood that you must have sent a message I'd missed. I knew what had happened. You'd had a tiff with Bill and made up at the last moment. I couldn't blame you for forgetting about everything else when there was a chance to see him after all you were engaged to him. It was all my own fault that I'd been pretty consistently overlooking that. 
But the awakening was tough, mighty tough. I went home and sat for a while in the darkness of the porch. I think I even cried a little. <laughs> Silly, wasn't it? I went for a long walk out to the lake and thought about all the times we'd tramped around it and lived over again all the things we'd done together. I argued with myself for hours, but in the end, there wasn't anything to do but take it. I was too miserable to notice when it began to rain, and by the time I got home, I was soaked to the skin in my new tux of wreck. Mother and Dad were home from their Friday night bridge club, and Mother was waiting for me. I could tell by her face that she'd heard at the club that you were with Bill, but she only asked whether I'd gone to the dance and would I like some cocoa. That was the last time Mother ever came into my room and kissed me goodnight. After she'd turned off the light, she stood by my bed for a minute and said quietly, Marcia is a very loyal girl, Victor, even to her mistakes. It was months later when I figured out what she meant. Too late. By morning, I had a terrible cold, and by Monday, it was a fine case of pneumonia. When I was better, you were my first visitor. You apologized about the prom, and I told you I understood. You said a pretty nice thing, too, when you told me you wouldn't have gone up to see Bill if you'd realized it was the same day as our date. I couldn't really believe that. But it made me feel better just to know you wanted me to believe. You weren't allowed to stay very long, but we agreed you were coming over every day until I was able to go out again. I wasn't ever sure if your eyes were wet when you said, So long till tomorrow. You leaned over and kissed me on the cheek. But I was so confused that I don't know if there were tears or not. I smelled the freshness of you and your lips were so soft. What was the name of that nurse? Uh, Miss Merrill. That's it. Miss Merrill came in and shooed you out and you said, Take good care of him, Miss Merrill. Confidentially, he doesn't know it yet, but he's my best beau. I never saw you again. Your aunt died that night, and you and your mother went away for the funeral. You stayed for a while afterward, and I had a postcard from you. But before you came back, Father decided to take over the New York office. We sold the house that summer, and I was so busy finishing high school and going to college, I never went back. For a long time, I was miserable over you, but I never had the courage to write, because by then I knew you and Bill had broken off that weekend. Besides, there wasn't anything I could tell you in the letter. Ten years is a long time. I went into the Air Corps, four years of war, a year and a half of getting started in Father's business, and now, in two weeks, I go west to manage the San Francisco office. It's strange that I should be wasting this afternoon here at a cocktail party. You have to have good eyes to be in the Air Force, as you know. So maybe that's why I think I can see you're wearing only one ring on your right hand. I'm going to walk straight across the room and find out if that's a moonstone in an Indian teardrop setting. And if it is, two weeks will be long enough. Uh, <clears throat> you don't remember me, do you, Marcia? This has been Elsie Lee's short story, Souvenir, as told by Nelson Olmsted. And now a closing word. Well, this story appeared recently in Woman's Home Companion. We've enjoyed having you with us today. This is Nelson Olmsted saying goodbye and good reading. Nelson Olmsted has presented another great short story from the world of literature. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company.